back to the DOD Risk Management Framework Series. I'm Mike Redmond here to help you walk step by step to implementing the DOD Risk Management Framework. We've made it to step two, selection of security controls. Throughout this chapter, we're going to help you identify your information system's common controls, select the appropriate baseline controls for your information system, tailor the security controls for your information system, and supplement the baseline and tailored controls for your information system as a whole. Also, we will develop and support a continuous monitoring strategy. If you're studying for the ISC Squared CAP certification, be sure to review the relationships between the FIPS 199, the categorization step, and FIPS 200, the control selection steps. When it comes to selecting security controls, there are four primary tasks. The common control identification, the security control selection themselves, the monitoring strategy, and the system security plan approval. So, in step one, when we categorized our system, we developed a common baseline of security controls. Those were based on the impact levels from our selections. Remember, those impact levels were based on confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and the overall impact of compromise. Now it's time to enhance the baseline security controls from the appropriate tables. For the Department of Defense, that would be the CNSSI 1253. Throughout this step, we are going to tailor our baseline security controls, either by inserting or deleting controls as it is appropriate for the information system itself, and then of course document any changes that we make. When we look at these security controls, we have three base selections. They will either be system specific, a common control, or a hybrid control. These controls are identified simply by ownership or some portion of ownership. Uh, for instance, system specific controls will provide security for a particular information system only. Common controls provide security for multiple information systems under their umbrella. And then hybrid security controls obviously would be a combination of the two. The security controls themselves cover these basic areas. Risk assessment, system services and acquisition, configuration management, personnel security, physical and environmental protection, contingency planning, system and information integrity, identification and authentication, accountability and audit, certification, accreditation and security assessments, security planning, system and communications protection, awareness and training, media protection, uh, maintenance, incident response, access control, and overall program management. Upon the completion of this step, you will pretty much finalize the system security plan itself. Through the system control identification, we are going to determine whether or not the control is sufficient supplement those control with a system specific or a hybrid control, or quite possibly we will just need to accept the greater risk. The primary roles involved in this step would be the CIO themselves, the CISO or the CISO, the information security architect, and the common controls provider. So when we look at common controls, these are the controls that are provided by some other hosting system. Uh, for instance, an enclave. Again, you can identify a common control simply by identifying where your administrative control ends and somebody else's picks up. If you have no ability to administratively affect a specific control, it would be identified as a common control. That brings us to step two. Once we've identified our baseline controls, we need to begin to tailor that baseline. It's supplement with any controls that may be required or necessary to provide overall minimum assurance. Again, the primary roles that we will be involved here is the information security architect and the information security owner. So, our baseline controls come from the NIST Special Publication 853. 
Here you're going to find the security control descriptions, any enhancements and scoping guidance, tables for translating the low, moderate, and high impact results to a minimum security control baseline, and any amplifying guidance for tailoring the minimum control baseline to the system's real requirements. Again, here's a look at the 18 families within the 853 control set, identified by the long name or the family and their two letter identifier. All security controls will be identified at a minimum by the two letter identifier. Now, looking at, for instance, the Appendix D of the 853, this one in particular is for access control. You can see the two-letter identifier, for instance, in the first line, AC1. That is the parent identifier for this control. Access control policies and procedures. You see AC1 applies to all low, moderate, and high systems. Now. Now it gets a little tricky. For instance, let's go down to uh, AC4, Information Flow Enhancement. You recognize if your initial control baseline is low for confidentiality, this control would not be indicated. However, if it is moderate, now AC4 would be included as well as for high. Let's do one more. AC6, least privilege. Again, for a low initial control baseline, this is not an indicated control. Uh, however, for moderate and high, it gets a little different. You see, for moderate, AC6 enhancement 1, 2, 5, 9, and 10 would be indicated. Uh, for high, it would be enhancements 1, 2, 3, 5, 9, and 10. You will need to walk these steps for each identified control for your information system. You will also see a column identified as priority codes, P1, P2, P3, and so on. These four DoD systems are not implemented. All controls are implemented with the same priority. The priority codes only affect the federal systems. Next, let's take a look at the CNSS 1253 itself. This is going to provide you an overall baseline for security controls. This is the security control selection for all national security systems. The core steps are still the same. Select the initial set of security controls, tailor the initial set of security controls to the system, and then supplement the tailored set of security controls for the system requirements. And a reminder that all DOD systems have been indicated to be national security systems. So within the 1253, this is what our table turns out to. Uh, again, you see AC1, Access Control Policy and Procedures, is indicated for all confidentiality, integrity, and, avail and availability, low, moderate, and high. However, there are mixtures and differences once you change the moderate and high, for instance, or maybe even just the high. It's a pretty simple chart to read. You just need to pay attention to each identified control and their subparents, as well as enhancements. So, uh, Guidance 1 in the 1253, the confidentiality and integrity objectives are largely focused on reading and writing, or disclosure and modification. Uh, cryptographic methods provide the ability to address disclosure by encrypting information, hence protecting against disclosure. Uh, the integrity, through uses of hashes and cryptographic hashes, will protect against modification. So, the controls that address the use of cryptographic methods are typically allocated to confidentiality and integrity based controls. Uh, amplifying Guidance 2 deals with the integrity objective, understanding it's also concerned with the correctness of the action. Uh, the availability objective is primarily concerned with the survivability and ensuring that the resources are there when the user requires them. Uh, the availability objective is also concerned with consequence management and countering certain activities aimed at a denial of service.
Next, let's take a look at the FIFT 200. Uh, using the special publication 853, the goal here is to achieve adequate security. Now, we probably need to define adequate. For controls selection based on the FIPS 199 impact level, for low impact information systems, organizations must employ appropriate controls for the low baseline of security controls defined in the 853. For moderate impact information systems, the moderate baseline and so on. So does that help us really define adequate? Probably not. The identification of adequate is simply, are you doing what's best for the information system? Have you met the requirement? Remember, once we get to the validation step, the validators are there to ensure not only that the security control is working properly, but also working as intended. So, let's start tailoring our controls. Uh, remember, these are all built on top of each other. Uh, for instance, you would start with the 853 and the CNSS 1253. Uh, then, if you're an Army individual, you would lay the AR-25-2 requirements on top of that, any command-specific requirements, any augmentation for location, any specific laws or regulations like PII or health data, and then any other requirements, for instance, the uh, authorizing official may impose upon it, and then any specific system controls that need to be addressed. Uh, remember, the tailoring part is the heart of how the risk management framework is implemented. It is not a checklist. It is not DICAP 2.0. The framework is specifically designed to only implement what the system needs and nothing more and nothing less. Why? It's all about resourcing and resourcing correctly and adequately. Next, you will need to start defining your monitoring strategy. Uh, this ranges all the way from configuration management and control processes through the overall security impact of uh, proposed or actual changes to the system. Also, we need to take a look at the assessment of selected systems throughout its life cycle and the security status reporting that will be required. Uh, again, this will go as an appendix to the system security plan as a whole. Uh, general roles that are included at this point would continue to be the information system owner as well as the common control provider. So when we identify monitored controls, uh, which controls are we really looking for? Well, it's determined by the information system owner or the common control providers themselves. Uh, the controls that are most volatile or critical or on the POAM must be included for continuous monitoring. Now, we need to determine how often we will monitor. Well. This is in part set by the determination of trustworthiness of the common control provider, as well as any outcomes from prior risk assessments and ensuring that it can be continued throughout the life cycle of the system. Remember, when we deal with continuous monitoring, it is not just the thing with blinky lights. About 70% of continuous monitoring has the physical aspect to it. You don't turn on a computer at all. It would include policy reviews and physical inventory and physical access to facilities. Don't think you're going to get a magic bullet that you're going to turn on and see the configuration of all your systems and call it a day. It has to be physical and technical. So, as we decide and look at these controls, we need to begin looking for an eye towards implementation and assessment, uh, building, for instance, an assessment case for those controls. As an assessment case is an example assessment procedure that provides specific actions that an assessor might carry out during the assessment phase of the system validation. It's there to help understand the control enhancement for the information system to assure that the enhancement or the tailoring that we've done is appropriate. Finally, once we've selected our baseline, 
tailored our baseline and begun to develop at least a draft continuous monitoring plan, it's time to seek approval. At this point, we will finalize the system security plan and send it forward to the authorizing official or their representative for final approval. For most components, only at this step can you even begin to start soliciting for a validator to come visit the system. Uh, technically, until this step is complete, until the system security plan is signed, the system and the controls do not exist. In the next section, we will move on to step three, the implementation phase.